Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Nomi Key Show. I am Nomi Key Konst. Uh, we're here live from my grandparents' living room in Tucson, Arizona. I think so many of us have uh, reassessed our lives pretty much overnight and restructured them. Uh, many have kids at home. Uh, many are, are working overtime right now and are unsure about your futures, uh, as, as is expected. Um, we are going to adapt our show as much as possible. Our, of course, our studio is closed indefinitely in Brooklyn, and I'm going to try to set something up here, uh, if I can, in Arizona, uh, where I'm with my family, if, if those of you who don't know. Um, my, my parents are in Los Angeles most of the time, but they thought it was a little bit better for them because of health issues to be in Arizona, just to give you a little backstory here. <laughs> I'm like, why are you in Arizona? Um, so I am going to try to set up a studio here. So if you are not a patron yet, uh, please please <laughs> become a patron at patreon.com slash the Nomi Key Show. And if you haven't already subscribed to our YouTube channel, we're trying to hit 100,000 subscriptions within the next six weeks. I think we're on track to do so right now. So please share these videos far and wide. Uh, one other thing is I'm going to try really hard uh, to do more content. We will do our weekly episode, but I'm going to be filling in more interviews uh, throughout the week just because news is breaking so fast and Luckily, I, I have a, a, a pretty large group of um, experts from my previous roles as reporters that I can go to, uh, like our next guest, Robert Hockett, who I last interviewed uh, during, another, during another crisis, which was uh, the crisis in Puerto Rico. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I, was, I covered Puerto Rico for, for several months after the storm, and very quickly it went from the disaster aspect to the capitalism aspect. And I was connected to Robert Hockett, who is a, the Edward Cornell Professor of Law and Finance at Cornell University. He is the former in-house counsel at the New York Fed and the IMF, uh, and he's also an advisor, has been an advisor to AOC on the Green New Deal, Elizabeth Warren, sometimes, <laughs> and uh, the great Bernie Sanders, Senator Bernie Sanders. So, uh, Bob, thank you for taking the time to join us uh, during these crazy times to explain to us what the heck is going on. So great to see you again, Nomi. Thanks so much for having me on. Of course. Okay, so yesterday the Fed announced that they were cutting interest rates to, to 0%. Uh, let's just start with that and then get into all the doomsday predictions. Okay. <laughs> what <laughs> does that mean when they do that? So yeah, it's, it's basically what you can think of as a sort of supply side stimulus measure, right? The idea is that if you're lowering the cost of credit to the various businesses that borrow in order to finance their continued productive activity, then you're presumably going to give a bit of a boost, a little bit of a jolt to that productive activity. And the thought then is that that might at least partly counteract the sort of suppressive effect on productive activity that all of the so-called social distancing is likely to work. Now, if that were the only thing that they were to do, or the only thing that we as a polity uh, were to do, it would be almost worthless, right? But it could be, it can be helpful as a kind of complementary measure, as long as certain demand side measures are taken also. It, it, was it a signal to the market to, to chill a little bit, so it didn't, you know, fluctuate so severely as it has in the last couple of days? Yeah, that's sort of one of the functions of the rate cuts typically, right? On the one hand, it's meant to be material it's meant to make a sort of material difference in the sense that in theory it lowers the cost of borrowing, but it's also meant to sort of uh, serve a kind of signaling purpose in effect to sort of tell the general public and the business sector more uh, as well that you know we're on it, you know we're paying attention, we at the Fed we're watching this um, and we'll do whatever we have to do and are able to do. Uh, in order to sort of counteract, again, that depressive effect uh, that the social distancing is apt to have on productive activity. I think what's what's been so uh, difficult for, for folks is is the rapid pace of, of movement, and including lawmakers. Um, mm -hmm. We are still humans at the end of the day, and we have to be able to process things. And, and we've had to make severe adjustments to our lives uh, pretty much overnight. Yeah. You know, in times of war, yes, that has happened, but... You know, I would say, you know, reflecting on history, it, it's taken a little bit. There's There's been a gradual effect, you know. Um, the rapid pace of our news cycle probably uh, perpetuates this. The rapid mm -hmm. pace of this, this, the contamination um, perpetuates this. But also mm -hmm. it's affected by the way that we're all interconnected in the society today. And yeah. so just drastically an interconnected society and economy, overnight global economy, um, you know, I think a lot of folks are wondering 
is is this going to be so catastrophic in terms of of the economy that you know there there really is no option but for the government to intervene in a much more intense way than than the way they have in the past like when the global economy collapsed in 2008 mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, one, one way to look at a problem like this is um, it's a kind of, in a way, a massive collective action problem. And most of the most poignant problems that we face in our lives are of that character. So what I mean by that is to say that this is a kind of problem that sort of by definition can't really be dealt with uh, by individuals or even by multiple individuals if they're not acting in concert, right, together. So it's it's one thing, there are various problems that you or I might face or challenges that you or I might face, even in connection with this current crisis, that you and I, you know, is not touching your but there are other problems that neither of us can deal with uh, as an individual and that we also couldn't really deal with collectively if we weren't sort of acting in concert, if we weren't, in other words, coordinating our actions. And that's exactly why we have right certain agents or collective agents, as I tend to call them, who sort of act on behalf of groups of people. And of course, the most sort of extensive or inclusive collective agent of all is our national government, right? That is supposed to be working in the name of us all and on behalf of us all. And in effect, as our sort of agent. And I think, you know, there's so many of the specific micro challenges that come up in connection with this big macro challenge that is a pandemic that can only be dealt with in that kind of collective agent sort of way that essentially the federal government is called upon to do much more now within a very short span of time than it typically is under ordinary circumstances. Okay, so let's, let's, let's um, you know, doomsday scenario this out uh, mm -hmm. a little bit, you know, mm -hmm. A couple of days ago, I thought it would have been crazy uh, that, you know, entire cities would shut down, but yeah. they are. Um, mm. We really haven't faced this in modern time. I mean, in, in, in the last 50 years, anything like this whatsoever. Um, mm. it, it makes it, it, it makes the, the scare tactics of McCarthyism, mm. uh, look, you know, comical at this point. Um, yeah. Just yeah. The last few days. So when you have a workforce that is being forced to practice social distancing, stay home. You know, we're not even just talking about um, food service workers anymore. We're talking about, uh, you know, folks working from home, uh, Delta having to slash employees and slash, you know, by 50%, which were there in the effort of doing before, prior to this. So let's just, mm -hmm. you know, there. Um, you have, you know, several institutions that have shifted the way that they're functioning and operating. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is gonna have such a drastic effect on our economy that, mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I'm, I'm trying to put my head for younger viewers who are watching who I can't believe the 2008 collapse was 12 years ago, but it was. Yeah, that went fast. <laughs> yeah, it went very fast. We still haven't solved those problems. So, I mean, let's 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 go back just a little bit because I, I had to lay out like what was ha what's happening in the last few days to kind mm -hmm. of think back to 2008, which was right before an election. Um, mm -hmm. I don't remember, mm -hmm. you know, the Lehman Brothers filed, I think, September 16th or so, 2008. Mm -hmm. uh, what were the immediate actions that were taken by the government, the Bush administration, we have to keep in mind, mm -hmm. and then later by the Obama administration um, in reaction? How fast did they act? Just so we can kind of compare mm -hmm. scenarios. Um, sure. Looking at recent history. Yeah. So, you know, to, on the one hand, you know, I think to their credit back in 2008, they did act quite quickly, especially after Lehman Brothers collapsed in September, on September 8th uh, of 2008. Um, you know, there's a bit of a lag. I mean, the first really serious sign that things were really going to hell in a handcart really quickly uh, was when Fannie Mae was put into conserv conservatorship. I believe that was August 25th of 2008. So it took a couple of weeks. But once Lehman collapsed uh, a couple of weeks later on September September 8th, they moved quickly. That's the sense in which they did, I think that they, you know, were sort of wise. Um, the sense in which they were less than wise was that they really focused on the supply side, to introduce that distinction again that I mentioned a moment ago. That's to say they looked at shoring up the banks, and the reason they looked at shoring up the banks was that the banks are our primary source of credit, right, in our economy. And that credit, among other things, of course, fuels economic activity. So in a certain sense, they were sort of treating the banks as 
though they were petroleum outlets or gas stations or what have you, and saying, oh, if these things crash, there won't be any, any petrol in the cars or in the trucks. You know, basically the fuel, fuel will be gone and the economy will then sort of grind to a halt. Now, it's true that supply side measures were important to take, but it was at least as important. And I argued at the time and still argue to this day, like many other people do, that demand side measures were much more important or much more needed at that time. And on that, frankly, they were quite weak. Both the Bush administration was and the Obama administration was. Even when uh, the big stimulus package of about 800 some odd billion was ultimately passed in Congress during the early days of the new Obama administration, those themselves were kind of a little bit, you might say sort of too little too late. And you know, half of them, about half of, of the stimulus at that time took the form of these sort of tax cuts, which are themselves just more supply side measures. So the real key, I think, the real key touchstone or the thing really to kind of, I think, attend to for all of us to kind of, the, the ball that we should all keep our eyes on makes up more than two thirds of aggregate demand in the economy. It's what is required in order to keep the productive process going, right? So we really have to maintain that demand, which keeps the productive process going. And that means demand side measures. That in turn means things like income support. Uh, it means things, uh, of course, like debt holidays and the like. Um, basically, anything that might prevent you or I from engaging in the kind of spending activity that would, we would normally engage in in order then to stimulate continued economic activity we have to engage in. One thing I'll add really quickly, and then I'll, I'll, I'll shut up for a moment, is it would be helpful in the present context, there are some specific supply side measures I think that we ought to take to complement those demand side measures, supply side measures that would not have been relevant back in 2008. And what I have in mind in particular is various goods and services, medical essentials and the like, the stuff that's on that normally would be on the shelves that of course is now not on the shelves <laughs> because of all the hoarding that's going on. So the thing is, if there's just not stuff out there to buy because the shelves are empty, then even the demand side measures aren't going to be as helpful as they might because if you and I have a bit more income now or some income support in the form of a temporary UBI or whatever it might be, if we can't buy anything with it, or if we're simply, you know, basically competing with others who have those same payments for a dwindling supply of goods, then we're just going to inflate the, inflate the prices of those goods. That makes me think that what we really, something that we really have to do, and this doesn't seem to be getting any attention at all, as far as I can tell right now, is to figure out ways to keep the production process going too notwithstanding the social distancing, right? So if you and I have to be together under the same roof to produce things that people consume, including medical essentials, and yet if we can't be close together because of the social distancing imperative, maybe we need things like hazmat suits and masks and things so that we can continue to work under the same roof without you know, propagating the illness. I think that that's probably gonna be the next frontier to start working on. And again, unfortunately at the moment, nobody seems really to be talking about it. That's that's honestly the conversation that I've been having in my in my home with my family is mm -hmm. my mother um, she has been sick and she was limited on the um, amount of pharmaceuticals she could take with her because they don't let you take uh, order more than a certain amount um, that's mm -hmm. just like you they don't want people uh, for whatever reason uh, yeah. I don't think we're going to be taking this type of medicine in, in, <laughs> in, 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 in not for a while we hope yeah. yeah. But, 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 you know, and it, uh, but it highlights uh, manufacturing of pharmaceuticals as well. And a lot of these pharmaceuticals come from China and they've halted production in China, um, or at least temporarily they did. And so you think about the supply chain of this country and you have people um, who are unable to go out. Okay. There's one aspect that you're not consuming uh, things that are immaterial essentially to your life. Just mm -hmm. we're Americans. So yeah. <laughs> we like our things. Um, <laughs> But there's there's the bare bare essentials and things like pharmaceuticals, uh, toilet paper, of course. Mm -hmm. So when you think about the supply chain, um, I feel like it's not functioning. Other than the fact that it's it's you know the workforce aspect, but it's not functioning in the same mm -hmm. way that it would in term in a normal economy, in like Adam Smith style economy. Like he did not prepare us for what happens when everybody's at home suddenly. Mm -hmm consuming at larger rates, but there's no supply available yeah. and the supply chain workforce has been cut off. Mm -hmm. So this, I, I, has there ever been a situation like this, especially at a global scale? I mean, mm -hmm. you and I talked about 
Puerto Rico. Yeah. And to me, that is an example of, it was like a microcosm of mm. what we're, we're dealing, we're potentially going to deal with right now. And I'm not trying to be doomsday, but like having mm. seen firsthand, but there was always like the aid from the U.S. that might come in. Mm -hmm. the, the toilet paper and the paper towels being thrown at the Puerto Rican people. <laughs> By the president. Yeah. The paper towels. <laughs> yeah. Um, no one's going to come and throw paper towels at 300 million people. Yeah. Yeah. No, really, really great question. And, and unsurprisingly to me, uh, your family is ahead of the policy wonks <laughs> and the legislators when it comes to talking about what matters or what's likely to be, you know, the next most urgent need. So, um, you know, in, in previous conversations that you and I have had, um, you, of course, have heard that I grew up in New Orleans. And so the case of Katrina always comes to my mind. Along with uh, Puerto Rico, that was actually something that I, I helped Senator Warren with was essentially the Territorial Relief Act at the time. And those two examples, I think, are really help get a feel for what things might happen. In life. You can view them, in other words, as sort of microcosms uh, of the kinds of challenges that we're going to face uh, nationwide. Um, except, of course, nationwide means on a much, much more massive scale, as you said. Um, I'm, I'm thrilled that you mentioned Adam Smith because, interestingly enough, because one interesting thing that we can learn, not only from Smith, but from the other so called political economists of the late 18th and early 19th century, is just how important what you might call synergies of production or the division of labor is to productive volume, right? So this is just a long-winded or very academic-y or wonky way of saying that, you know, we all specialize. We all have our particular roles that we play. And then we're all sort of brought together into one sort of synergistic productive machine, each of us performing our particular roles. And anything that sort of disrupts this kind of harmonious synergistic interaction of the various contributors to economic activity or to productive activity is going to disrupt the supply chain and hence the supply of essential goods and services. That in turn, I think, means that we do have to figure out ways to keep the, uh, it means at least two things, I guess. One is we have to figure out means of Con, uh, basically keeping the productive process underway. So to go back to that example of the shop floor, if you and I both you know, have different tasks, but we work under the same roof uh, in the processes of production, and now it suddenly said, well, social distancing also means workplace distancing. We can't be under the same roof because we might communicate the virus to one another. Maybe there are ways that we can develop really quickly to enable us to continue to work even in close proximity together without propagating uh, a viral uh, infection of one kind or another. So again, things like hazmat suits or masks or whatever, I mean, it'll look dystopian and, and even science fiction -y and gross, but if we got to do it, <laughs> we'll do it, right? And that suggests to me that we might want to sort of ramp up production really quickly of things like hazmat suits and masks and things, but not just of the kind that people might wear when they get on subways or whatever, but the things that people might have to wear in order to be able to work together to keep producing. So that's the first kind of measure. The second, I think you've also characteristically presciently uh, sort of anticipated, and that is that, you know, we ought to be ready to import some things that we might need if we can't wrap up production quickly enough. And that might mean temporarily suspending certain trade sanctions or trade impediments that we currently have, you know, tariffs and quotas and the like. An interesting case in point, for example, came up this weekend. It turns out that Cuban doctors, apparently, um, I, this isn't, I've only read this in a few sources yet, so I don't know how confirmed it is, but assuming that these sources are accurate, it looks as though Cuban, do Cuban doctors have figured out a way to use recombinant uh, interferon, of which they have much in the way of stock, uh, to essentially retard the spread or growth of the virus, maybe even to kill it. Uh, and apparently it works so well that the Chinese are now ramping up production of precisely this material, right? These particular vaccines. So you've got Cuban doctors working with Chinese, um, I guess, production facilities, producing mass quantities of recombinant interferon, which apparently hasn't been used in this country for about 19 or 20 years, in order essentially to spread supplies throughout China, throughout other parts of the world as well. Now you can imagine uh, a certain White House administration saying, well, we don't import things. We're trying to sort of cut back on our imports from China, or we've got Cuba sanctioned. We don't want anything that the Cubans have come up with in this country. This might be a good time to suspend things like you know measures of that sort, at least temporarily, until, again, we're sort of on top of, uh, of the current pandemic. So, so let's talk a little bit about, and, and just real quick, uh, actually, before my next question, uh, for folks 
who are watching at home, I, I don't know if this is going to turn into the recording as well, but we're having a few technical glitches. A lot of people are having technical glitches right now um, when it comes to these video conferencing. I think it's just the overload of, of the conferencing tools. Um, so I'm going to actually ask another question. I was going to ask you about the political aspect, but the technical. Sure. We are relying uh, on on the, these apps right now. You know, yeah. in <clears throat> times of crisis, even climate crisis, um, you know, the different disasters, community coming together has really solved a lot of these problems. You know, uh, in Puerto Rico, you know, distributing food, you know, after months in some cases um, to communities that couldn't get food or access to water or power, of course, or their pharmaceuticals. But it was people coming together and volunteering and working very long hours and healthcare workers. Um, we're in a different situation now. We are literally being forced to separate. Um, you know, loved ones are going to have to see each other from, you know, talk to each other through glass in some situations. Um, and we're relying on these video conferencing tools. And, uh, you know, I there's a real fear in me. I, I, I hate to be living in fear, but there's a fear that our power grid is vulnerable, um, again, having seen this in other countries and other regions, mm -hmm. and that the only way that we're, we are able right now to really conduct, uh, to, to, to conduct business as usual and even communicate with our families is through this power grid and the Wi-Fi. And, and the internet and the broadband system. So do you, do you have any sense about measures or measures that could be taken to reinforce this? I mean, are they, I, I know that in some situations like in New York City, I got an email from Spectrum saying, uh, if you are unable to pay your bill this month, um, we are offering for low income people, you know, the opportunity to have free access to broadband because it is so important. Um, but I mean, what kind of measures are being taken? I'm worried about food and water and, and, and power. And I think that that's like the core essentials because, because we've seen in other places that it does go away in an instant. Yeah. So yeah. what do you, what is the government able to do to, mm -hmm. to make sure that our power grid is still functioning and that workers are able to go and help reinforce the power grid? Yeah. So, you know, I think in a way, um, probably the closest analogy is the various sort of civil defense procedures and protocols that we sort of have, technically speaking, on um, sort of, I guess you could say, sort of at the ready or sort of on the books, right? There are various protocols that get engaged when certain uh, other triggering events happen and when triggering decisions are taken. So the actual declaration, finally, uh, that this is a national emergency uh, this weekend will be immensely helpful, although again, it probably should have happened a little earlier, but it'll be helpful in the sense that it immediately triggers certain ancillary authorities that have to be triggered or have to be engaged in order for the various important measures that have to be taken to be taken. A lot of these are in the nature of sort of civil defense measures and national defense measures. And a lot of these protocols then involve the use of National Guard troops and other sort of essential federal personnel. In this case, not to run around with guns and go around, you know, shooting people who are looting or whatever has happened at, you know, during Katrina, but just operating machinery or just operating grid, the power grids and other kinds kinds of essentially infrastructural uh, facilities, um, that probably should be top priority. It seems to me that if we, you know, this is fairly common sense, but uh, but it's possible that some people in DC right now don't have the requisite degree of common sense. I don't know, but it seems as though common sense would dictate that A, we prioritize these essential grids uh, when it comes to sort of power generation and power distribution. And then B, um, the facilities pursuant to which or with which we manufacture various essentials and then distribute those essentials, again, like medical uh, medical goods or, med or medicines and other kinds of medical equipment, um, uh, essential foodstuffs, um, you know, other kinds of things that people need in their homes just to sort of live in their homes for a while. Um, and if we prioritize in that particular way, and then if in addition to that, we take account of the fact that an additional challenge right now is to make sure that those who are doing this provisioning, this kind of cooperative or collaborative provisioning, have to be protected against transmission of the virus too. That would seem to me to spell, again, some kind of hazmat clothing uh, that, that can be uh, given immediately 
uh, to those essential personnel who are doing that sort of supply work. That might be National Guard folk. It might be just ordinary personnel who already work in uh, the generation facilities or, or what have you. Whoever it is who's going to kind of continue working out there in the world to sort of generate and provide and distribute uh, these various essentials while the rest of us are sort of social distancing. Obviously, it seems to me they should receive uh, those kinds of protections immediately. And once we have that sort of in place and we can be relatively, I guess you could say, confident that it will continue, um, then we can sort of take next steps about what more to provide or what more to produce or what other kinds of kind of compensatory measures to take uh, in response to what looks to be uh, likely to be a, at least a two or three month long uh, exigency. Um, I, I, yeah, I was thinking of places uh, like Greece and, 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 and obviously Spain has gone through similar, a similar situation and Italy, um, regions of austerity in the Western world, uh, yeah. in Western democracies, but also, you know, Venezuela. I mean, this is the joke that, you know, Fox News likes to play all the time, these socialist mm -hmm. countries. Uh, but the, but the reality... <laughs> I think our audience is smart enough to understand the difference here. Um, but there is this fear of of what happens. Uh, you know, I've spent a lot of time in Greece and, you know, the, the consequences of their economic disaster are still there. Uh, people I know literally lived off the land for years. Um, it was no joke. This is just, just to put this in perspective, Greece is the most educated country in Europe, uh -huh. right? Capital, and, right. Yeah. And, you know, the average young person had multiple degrees, uh, was being forced to leave the country and or move in with their families to live off of their parents' pensions. So thinking about uh, the crisis that Greece faced, you know, just a few years ago, not being able to access money through their ATMs, the economy literally shutting down overnight and really never recovering for the most part. Yeah. Uh, and people making a couple hundred bucks a month still on average. In Europe, uh, I mean, I think I look to Greece, and I think this is potentially where we're going. Um, and then I look to Venezuela, <laughs> and I think about that might be potentially where we're going. So yeah. let's 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 just play this out because I think um, from an economic lens, like how can we learn from these two countries that have faced such tremendous. Uh, you know, a crisis in the last few years because of the way that their governments, and I, I include Greece and Germany, right, in, in the EU, um, how they handled an economic crisis. Yeah. So I think there are a few things to learn, right? One uh, is, you know, I, it, one thing I find kind of maddening or at the very least sort of bemusing, and I'm sure that you do as well, is the sort of throwing around of all of these words that are sort of ideologically loaded and and maybe in the 19th century it made sense for them to be loaded but but it doesn't really seem to me to make much sense for them to be loaded now and it's tempting sometimes just to start from a clean slate just throw away all the loaded words all of that kind of terminological baggage and just go right back to sort of common sense ordinary lingo that we use with one another so you know doing that now i would say okay look there's some things that people do individually we do on our own right I brush my own teeth nobody else brushes my teeth if I were incapacitated then I would have to do that with somebody else or if uh, my grandmother um, needed help doing that we would do that together but under ordinary circumstances we brush our teeth alone there are other things we do together right if you're playing a, a string quartet or if you're playing in an orchestra and you're producing a symphony lots of different people have to act together and in concert and time things properly and play their appointed instruments and so forth. There are lots of things we kind of have to do together in that way. We collaborate in that way. That's why we have an army. It's why we have police. It's why we have fire departments. You know, it's not the case that you individually just put out your own fire if your house catches fire. Um, this is a massive nationwide fire in a sense, right? And indeed, it's a kind of global fire. That means it's one of those things we work together to deal with. Now, I think one of the problems um, that has been, you know, one of the saddest and most tragic, um, I suppose, characteristics of the Greek situation and the Spanish and actually the Southern situation, Southern European situation more generally over the last 10 years or so, 
has been that essentially the infrastructures through which we act collectively or collaboratively in that way have been essentially eroded. They've been, in effect, kind of dismantled, largely thanks to various austerity policies that were put in place, you know, back in 2010 and so forth. Um, here in the States, we've, of course, been acting kind of similarly, you know, that, that, that ridiculous comical character, uh, Grover, Grover Norquist, you know, trying to sort of starve the beast or drown the state in the bathtub. And that sort of equally comical character, Steve Bannon, saying that his uh, goal is to sort of deconstruct the administrative state. That's just basically another way of saying eliminating all of the means by which we are able to act together. And that seems absurd to me because, again, there are certain things that we do have to act together on. Um, so, you know, what does that mean for right now? I think what it means for us right now is a couple of things, right? There's a long term lesson, you might say, and a shorter term lesson. The longer term lesson is, well, you know, maybe it's actually a good idea to have at least some of the administrative state in place, because that's just another way of saying we have the kind of uh, action equivalent of a power grid, right? We we have structures through which we can act together, right? That Turn we can act on your own house. <laughs> I mean, I'm sorry? You, you can't generate power in your own house. Yeah, exactly, right. So, you can't. So, just, so that's the sort of long-term message, right? Um, the shorter-term message is, look, let's do everything that we have to do right now to reconstruct whatever has been deconstructed. That means ad hoc measures that, you know, that can enable us to act together collaboratively to address this shared problem, uh, then so be it. Uh, if it means um, sort of ramping up or uh, rehabilitating certain structures that we still have, but that have been kind of temporarily atrophied, maybe because somebody in the White House fired everybody in that department or hasn't appointed anybody to head up that department, let's act now to put somebody at the head of that department and rehire those people and then give them the fringe benefit of hazmat suits if necessary. <laughs> but, you know, basically let's put back in place the sort of infrastructures through which we collectively act, right? Through which we act together to collaborate on the problems that we have to collaborate to solve. And again, that doesn't mean that we you know, send government agents into people's homes to brush people's teeth. That's stuff that we can indeed do individually. But anything that has to be done in group, by, by groups or by you know, groups of people collaborating. And again, this no, there's no contradiction between that and sort of you know, uh, free market economic thinking. I mean, again, going back to Adam Smith, who you mentioned before, and these political economists, you know, if you think about it, what is a shop floor or what is a factory or what is a corporate corporation or a firm other than a mechanism through which multiple people collaborate and act together in productive ways. You know, for some purposes, a firm or a corporation is an is it's sort of it operates at the adequate scale, right? It's got the right number of people working together in the right ways. But it is indeed a form of collective agency. It's just a so-called private sector form. Some problems that we have require even larger scale than that. And that means that the entire country, the entire nation collaborates together through various collective agents that we used to call governments uh, to address, you know, again, common problems that you and I can't individually uh, address. And if we just throw away all the kind of ideological baggage words and just say, look, here's some stuff we do together, here's some stuff we do uh, by ourselves, and then within the class of things that we do together, some of the things we can do together in groups of 50 or 100 or 10,000, but other things that we do collect collaboratively, we do in groups of 320 million, um, or, you know, the, basically the whole nation. and. If we just sort of think along those lines, it seems to me that'll enable us maybe to kind of think clearly both about the immediate problems that we have to address and then also after that about the sort of longer term problems that we're apt to face in the way of sort of fallout from the current crisis and also in the way of sort of putting in place ways of preventing a repeat of this of this particular crisis. I'll, I'll grow the tomatoes. Uh, you make the cheese. Okay. okay. <laughs> My dad would make the soap and. Uh... <laughs> okay, that's good. Yeah, I'm 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 fairly good at sewing, so I can take care of your clothes okay. for you. I can repair your clothing if you need, Nomi. Um, if you don't mind growing the tomatoes, <laughs> we'll do the old-fashioned right. division of labor. Right, we're right back to uh, right back to 18th century political economy. We really are. We really are. Um, no, but for real, we, you know, we 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 have to think about. Uh, how mail is going to be trans, you know, uh, transported, and how yeah. farmers are going to be protected, especially small uh, small farmers. You know, these are really important agencies in our life, right? In our lives right now. Mm -hmm. 
and thinking about the small business owners out there, the restaurant owners, uh, you know, that are being forced to shut down, not to mention, you know, so many other uh, companies out there that are, are really feeling the stress um, of this moment and families and people in vulnerable communities. I mean, this is such a big conversation that mm -hmm. I am going to ask you to come back on if you're okay uh, with that. Yeah, Robert. Yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah. I, I never, I, I, I never seem to think as coherently as I do when you and I are jointly thinking, um, speaking of collaborations and synergies, uh, it seems like my brain works better when the two of us are chatting. So any <laughs> time, I mean, really, it's, it's true. Yeah. Anytime. This is, this is, I, I think we've had a lot of these conversations in coming weeks. So um, very grateful to you, Bob, stay safe, stay healthy. Uh, enjoy quarantine in Ithaca. You uh, know, it's, I'll try. It's nice. <laughs> and, and the same to you, Nomi, and, and all my best to your to your parental units as well while you're there. You and you and your family as well. All right. <laughs> Take care. See ya.